Good morning, everyone. I know that there are people who are still trying to get on because we had a good number of registrants, but um, it's almost 10 after, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Melissa Rosen, and I am the Director of Education at Charcheret. Um, I want to introduce my colleague at Mount Sinai as part of the Woman to Woman program, Jillian Levinson, just logged on. Still in the wave if for those of you who can see. Yeah. <laughs> and she's going to be talking a little bit later. Um, but I want to I want to just jump in and get started. And hopefully the people who are trying to get in will still have the opportunity to join us shortly. Perfect. Again, my name is Melissa Rosen and I'm the director of education at Char Sharet. For those of you who are unaware, Char Sharet is the Jewish breast and ovarian cancer community. And I know many of you on are, are impacted directly by breast or gynecological cancers. It happens to be, Sharsher, it happens to be the Hebrew word for chain, which, as in we're all a link in the chain of support for one another while facing that. And we take that idea very seriously. We provide support um, to young women, to women and families of all Jewish backgrounds facing, again, breast and ovarian cancer at every stage, before, during, after a diagnosis. This presentation, just so you know you're in the right place, is entitled Shabbos, Shavuos, and Serenity. Um, and, and actually, the title is ordered inappropriately or incorrectly. We, start, we should actually start with serenity, that overarching, important, year-round concept or way to deal with the challenges in our life. And we'll finish with Shabbos and Shavuos and even the day-to-day -day obligations we have and celebrations we have. And I want to end with that because we have some very practical information. I know I do, but I know you do as well. And so I'd like to make the end of this a little bit of more of a uh, conversation. So let's start a little bit with the more intangible. Shavuos is coming. <laughs> really quickly, as our ancestors received the Torah at Har Sinai, it's recorded that our people heard thunder and lightning. They saw clouds and smoke filled the air. The experience was literally overbearing for the senses. We shook with fear. Ever have one of those days? I imagine you have when you heard the words, you have cancer, or you're BRCA positive, or the cancer's returned. You experienced an overwhelming burden to your senses. Perhaps you too shook with fear. The ensuing thoughts that recur after hearing words like that can be more agonizing than the realities. We are often overachievers when it comes to imagining these worst case scenarios. And while we can't stop intrusive thoughts from entering our lives, we can respond to those thoughts in ways that feel calming and empowering. When an intrusive thought comes my way, I imagine myself physically putting my arm around that thought, the way I would um, similarly to putting my arm around someone's shoulder. And I, I sort of say to the thought, I knew you were coming, I was expecting you. You can hang out here, but I have things to do. In other words, you're not giving that thought, it's the full attention, it's trying to demand. I find the more I welcome these thoughts and acknowledge them, the less those thoughts overwhelm me. And that helps me to calm the thunder, those overwhelming senses. By the way, remind yourself that um, today, anxiety may not just be coming from our, our cancer experience, wherever we are in that, but also with COVID. Um, and another way to deal with this is to remind yourself, the added stress of COVID is to remind yourself that you've kind of been there before and you know you've come through the other side, right? You know how to isolate because you may have been immunocompromised by treatment or exhausted by treatment. Um, and unlike other people, some other people out there today, 
you've been through a traumatic event and you know you're resilient. You're here today and you know you're resilient. And that is so empowering in the face of an additional stressor. So like I said, those kind of thoughts really do calm the thunder in my mind. You see, what I didn't tell you yet was that I am a two-time cancer survivor, including breast cancer six years ago. I know firsthand that cancer is not an easy endeavor. We've gone through or are still going through something traumatic. And while we're going through that every day, just seems about survival. You know, we don't have the time, the energy, the ability to address the larger issues that a diagnosis brings on. Um, while we're dealing with the physical realm of that diagnosis. The quiet times, by the way, including isolation and including um, Chagim, are often when that processing occurs because we're actually not wired to take both physical and emotional hits at the same time. So we lead with the physical simply to survive. We rally for surgeries, chemo, etc. And when there are lulls in the treatment or man mandated downtime from Shabbosim, Shabbosim or Chagim um, or social mandated social distancing, it's the time for us to address the emotional. This method, or more, more appropriately, this reality, I don't know if it's a formal method, can add to our stress, both emotional and physical. As I speak to women, as part of my shared responsibilities, I have conversations with them about the experiences they're having and the life altering events they're dealing with. You know, when we consider transforming events, we typically think of big occasions, marriage, the birth of a child, an illness, a death. But here's the thing. We should not only count those events or count on those events to transform ourselves. Today, right now, we're talking about illness, about cancer, but also about corona. And most of us will face all of these transforming events sometime in our lives. Yet every single day, we're faced with thousands of junctures that depending on how we react, how we behave, how we think about them, can also transform our lives. In a moment's breath, we can change our lives and the lives of the people we love. And I want us to think today about being more aware of these instances after tra and transforming the ordinary routine aspects of our lives into beautiful life-altering moments. The real question for all of us is, no matter, no matter what our current relationship is to cancer, how do we go from a cancer patient to a cancer survivor, or more appropriately, a thriver? How can each one of us live as someone who thrives, no matter what life has handed us? And this is how I'm gonna share with you. We're gonna take the liberty to change, or better yet, let's use the word reframe our stories. And I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that. It's not an easy thing to do, but we can do it. We tend to tell our stories over and over again in the very same way. We're afraid of losing something. We hold on to all of the pieces of our story because it's what we're familiar with and the future seems scary but we need to connect with the women we were on the day we were diagnosed and remind that woman of all you have learned through our cancer experiences, strength, courage, a change in priorities, and so much more. And then we need to talk to ourselves six months, two years, 10 years from now, and we need to share with that person all of the unknowns that we faced and how we've blossomed. Listen, I am not a person. Some people will say, oh, my cancer was a gift. You will never hear me say that. It just simply was not. But that doesn't mean there weren't positive things that have come out of it. We now know that we're brave, that we've faced challenges. 
we've made a difference and continue to do so in this world to those who are close to us and in the world as a whole. We've faced ordinary moments with grace, sometimes not with grace, but we've made memories and we've gained strength. I was able to change my story and it's made all the difference. As I said, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma 25 years ago. And because actually of my treatment for Hodgkin's, I was diagnosed with breast cancer six years ago. In my close-knit community, I was the expert on cancer, not once, but twice. That was my story, my sad story. But I was able, after a lot of work, to let that part of my psyche go. Of course, I'm still a cancer survivor. And I certainly do not neglect my health. I absolutely do all of the appropriate follow-up. The part I was able to relax after this hard work was the woe is me part. I've been able to use my cancer experiences for good. Personally, I work to support those facing similar diagnoses here at Charcheret, and I educate women to be proactive about their health. You may do it in other ways. You may share advice with someone who's received a similar diagnosis. You may make meals for someone who is facing a different illness, but you're doing good in the world. Now today, listen, I accept the side effects and the daily injustices to my body as simply moments, individual moments, and not who I am as a whole. A cancer survivor is not who I am. It's just one of the things, one of the many things I happen to be. And that's the attitude we should all be taking. Reframing our stories allow us to change the way we look at our lives, the way we live our lives. I'll give you another example. When my kids were younger, they would come up from school and sometimes they'd talk about their horrible days. We would talk more and it turns out that very often it came down to 10 bad minutes because a friend rebuffed them or they tripped at recess and were embarrassed. I worked very hard to change that mindset. They didn't have a bad day. They had a bad few minutes. And we all have that over the course of a day. Again, we encounter the concept of counting time. What was the rest of their day like? Did they ace a test, make a new friend? Were they kind to someone? Maybe what it is, is that we have a faulty understanding of time. The stressful events, the sad times, tend to be at the forefront of our minds. We can't help it. We worry. Will this be the new norm? Is this it? Will my child's friend continue to shun her? Will my cancer reappear? Will co the COVID-19 restrictions remain in place indefinitely? What will these things take from me? We catastrophize. But this isn't actually an accurate conception of time. Beginning um, on the second night of Pesach, until next week, we count the Omer. And I'm reminded during this time of how frequently we hear the women of Shar Sharet counting. Three more days until my surgery. I'm one week post-surgery. Three more days until I get my path report back. Third treatment in, five more to go. Today is two years post-diagnosis. Just six months till my follow-up scan. But there's another dimension to this counting. Women living with cancer are not really merely watching the calendar. They're making their lives count. Every day I hear from women, women in my neighborhood, women in my shul, women I've met through Shar Sharif, who are strengthening their relationships, not sweating the small stuff and finding meaning in their lives. Women who are sharing what they've learned through cancer or anything else and supporting one another. Throughout this experience or journey, women are experiencing these aha moments. You know, one caller, Sharsheret caller, shared that while she was home recovering from surgery, she spent a lot of time sitting with her kids, chatting, laughing, watching television, 
And she said something interesting. She said, these were moments that at a different point in time, she would have described as doing nothing because she wasn't running around doing things with her kids or for her kids. She realized that the time spent being still and focused in the simple moment of spending time, she felt more connected to them. And this woman, this caller, felt a shift in herself and in her relationship with her family. Certainly today, as we isolate, we don't need to be recovering from surgery or from a chemo treatment to experience this. But we need to reframe these moments. As we approach Shavuos, I'm grateful to the women and families of Sharsheret for reminding me that it's not just about counting time but it's about making time count. You know, it's interesting how people use time. We take one 365th or six, yeah, 65th part of the year. We sort of outline it in red in our calendars. We call it a birthday, or we define it as an anniversary, a vacation, a chag. Each is appropriately designated for happiness, relaxation, commemoration, whatever it is. Instead of learning how to merge our lives with its flow, we prefer to relate to it in bits and pieces. Instead of connecting to the totality of time, we focus on the few small, heavy, heavily bordered segments for which we can ascribe or to which we can ascribe some unique quality or functions. It's natural, we're looking for specialness. Everything else just is, and as such, unworthy of our energy uh, or attention. But I don't think that's really how we are. Maybe it's only on the surface. If we delve deeper, I think you'll find that truly, the truly satisfying areas of our lives, the thing we, things we most value, we most remember and reminisce about are the routine perpetual parts. Consciously, we seek the special, but subconsciously, I believe our deepest strivings are for the regular. You know, the only thing that gives meaning to time is how it's spent. So is it possible for us to live our lives in a way where we can be aware of every second that time passes? Can you imagine if every minute spent was focused and thought through and if we were truly present? It takes an incredibly special person to achieve this, but that's not really the goal I'm talking about today exactly. There's a caveat, a really important caveat. Respect each moment because it truly has the potential to be beautiful, to be great, but don't work too hard on making every moment great. It's too much pressure. It's the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Right, right now, as an example, we hear a lot um, in relation to social isolation, like, what are you doing? Are you learning to bake bread? Are you learning to do yoga or meditate? How are you growing? The isolation is a great time um, to grow as a person. The same is sometimes true, we think, when our pace is a little bit slower while dealing with cancer. But the pandemic and the cancer experience, they're not enlightenment programs, right? There's a lot of pressure to constantly improve ourselves, to make these moments count in a way we might not have been able to before. Again, that's not something you have to force upon yourself. You need to do cancer recovery. You need to do uh, COVID isolation the way you feel right doing it. Some days, maybe you'll teach yourself a new challah recipe or, or a babka for, or learn how to make a babka for Shavuos. But some days you're not going to feel, you're going to feel like you can't get out of bed. And that's just as fine as learning how to make cheese babka for Shavuos. That's important to keep in mind. Okay, so we have taken time to address some of the larger issues, the ones that can truly change the way we live our lives, the way we love our lives, the way we think about our lives. But I wanna take some time to talk about practicality. And I wanna get your input in this too. So at a certain point, I'll ask you if you have anything to add to please unmute yourselves and share. But no matter how we live our lives to the fullest, the reality is that cancer is exhausting and it can be a challenge to deal with the day-to-day. -day. Work obligations, family commitments, the prep for all Shabbosim and Chagim. Uh, you know, there, um, 
Sharshar was working with a woman, um, a young mother with two small children who was in the middle of breast cancer treatment. And it was the end of March um, and she was doing very well. She was about halfway through her treatment. Um, she was still working full time. She was still the children's primary caregiver. And she was doing great physically. Her doctor was so pleased that her body was reacting to treatment. She woke up one day at the end of March and could not get out of bed. So of course her husband brought her to the oncologist who did a physical exam and could find nothing that would be causal, that would cause um, the change in her, in her physical status. She happened to be on a call with one of our shared social workers later that day and was explaining what was going on. And after a conversation, the, the social worker said, what are you doing for Pesach this year? She thought about it. She said, you know, this is actually the first time in a decade I'm not hosting the Seders. What it was, was her aha moment. She was doing so very well in the rest of the aspects of her life that at, at different times she could almost think of treatment as just a to-do item to check off on her list. And this was her, oh my goodness, I really can't do everything that I was able to do before. I really am ill. And so we worked with her and her friends and her family and they, they turned over her home and they, they cooked for her and they, they, they brought this all to the Seder and they set a table in her home and they joined her and they served and they cleared and she was able to be at the table when she was able and to take a quick rest and then come back when she needed to. It wasn't exactly the same as it had always been. But it was enough to feel some normalcy, to feel like her life would move forward. So let's take a minute with Shavuos on the horizon and redefine what's necessary, right? So it's not just about Shavuos, it's about every day, it's about Shabbos, it's about a lot of things. But you know, we're so used to going above and beyond as we celebrate, um, but maybe it's okay to order in. I know um, many a, a woman who would normally cook um, up a beautiful meal for any particular Shabbos, who during treatment ordered pizza. Didn't prevent, uh, it didn't prevent them from lighting candles, joining together um, as a family at the Shabbos dinner table, singing Zmirot afterward, but, but it took the pressure off. Um, accept meals from those who are willing to share, to, to cook for you. Bring in a cleaning service if you need to. You don't need to be the one to prep the home for the Chag. You know, with Shavu is coming, do you really need a homemade cheesecake? Now, let me be clear, you clearly need cheesecake, but can this year it be store-bought? Maybe it's not Shavuos to you without learning, but all night in the show is just not in the cards this year for clearly many reasons. Why not rethink how you can do that? Consider a Zoom or phone learning prior to the start of Chag with girlfriends or with families you're friends with. And perhaps something you learn before the Chag starts will resonate with you in a way to jumpstart a bit of solo or family learning actually during the Chag. There are so many creative options that fall within the framework of halacha and ensure meaning for you and your family as we work our way through this annual calendar filled with special days and uh, individual days filled with special moments. So I want to take a, a moment to ask you to unmute yourselves and share some things like that, some practical tips that enhance your Chagim without diminishing your strength, both spiritual and physical, as you prep for Chagim and, and other days. You know what, why don't we start, I'm gonna put Jillian on the spot and ask her to share something. And Jillian, as a reminder, works with women, woman to woman at Mount Sinai. And I know she must have heard some, um, some ideas from the women she's worked with and, and counseled. So Jillian, would you mind starting us off? Sure. Um, I, I, not to 
punt it to somebody else. But I actually was going to ask Robin Finling if she wanted to introduce herself. Robin is one of the woman to woman survivor volunteers. Um, she's not able to stay for the whole webinar. And I was really hoping that she could quickly just introduce herself and maybe what she does because um, she can't stay for this whole time. And maybe she can use an example of the way that she um, could do that, if that's okay. Lovely. Thank you, Robin. Um, sure. Uh, my name is Robin Finling, and I am an 18-year survivor of ovarian cancer. Amazing. I'm also BRCA2 positive, as well as I did have a preventative mastectomy um, eight years ago yesterday. And uh, I have been a volunteer with the Woman to Woman program since uh, for the last about 16 years. And Jillian, do you want me to tell a little bit about the program? Is that what you yeah, want? Yeah, absolutely. If that's okay. Yeah, cool. sure. So we're we're a group of gynecological cancer survivors. Um, that the group was started about sixteen, probably about eighteen years ago, and there was a core of six women who very bravely uh, formed the Woman to Woman group, along with Dr. D uh, Dr. Dotino and a social worker, as well as a uh, psychologist. And the, uh, the group was started by Valerie Goldfine and her goal was is that no woman should ever feel alone during the diagnosis. Valerie is also a ovarian cancer survivor. And at that time, there was no one there for her to say, this is what you'll go through because unlike breast cancer, ovarian cancer is uh, not as well um, talked about. So what we do is we follow women from the time of diagnosis, post-surgery, throughout their chemo treatment, and we are there to share our experience as well as to listen to their experience, to, to listen to their highs and lows, um, sometimes just to be a friend, and um, sometimes to be a surrogate mom, sister, daughter. And we stay with women all throughout their cancer journey, as well as throughout the years, as much as someone wants us in their lives. So I hope that helps program. tell a little bit. Yeah, it's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful program. Thank you. Um, do you, ha Robin, do you happen to have, um, as, as someone who is a long-term survivor, mm -hmm. um, a suggestion or a tip about how you, you've learned to appreciate or simplify in order to continue embracing, you know, the life that you're living? Um, I, the most important thing for me is to try not to be so hard on ourselves, yeah. um, not to blame ourselves if we didn't eat something wrong, if we didn't go to the doctor, if we felt like we could have done better at finding our diagnosis, not to beat ourselves up and to just do what the best that we can do and, and to find some joy in each day, but really not to blame ourselves that we did something to cause this. That's what I find a lot that a lot of women share with us, that it's their fault that they did something, mm -hmm. that they had too much anxiety, too much stress in their lives. Yeah. And cancer has a way just to find us even, um, those that have stress and some people that have the most stressful jobs in the world never have cancer. So mm -hmm. I try not to, I try to stress for women and to support that they don't blame themselves and to beat themselves over this and um, that they will get through this, that they can do this. It is possible to get through a cancer diagnosis and, um, and go on with your life. Yeah, that's wonderful. And find a purpose because I, the purpose certainly found me. <laughs> in doing this so what ex perfect example of how women who have been through this very often find ways to pay it forward and and bring additional purpose to their lives yeah does anyone else have a practical idea or or a more overarching idea that they would like to share hi hi <laughs> um, 
I just wanted to say I, I certainly didn't volunteer to have breast cancer. I, uh, 14 years ago, I had what they called stage zero DCIS, which required like I had two surgeries and internal radiation and a pill for five years. Okay, that was considered stage zero. And then uh, recently, very, very recently, I now have only stage one, but that required a mastectomy in the end and whatever. But I wanted to say that I certainly didn't volunteer for any of this. But to let you know how grateful I am for certain things, I work very hard to find the good in everything. And I've had really some terrible stuff that's happened to me. And I have found the good in everything that has helped me to continue forward. And uh, I had the surgery on February 26th. And I was supposed to go to my son's house for a week or two to you know, recover, repair, whatever, for the two weeks, maybe three weeks. And I did that, and that turned into COVID-19. And uh, I had weddings to go to and Sheva Brachas and Shabbat Sheva Brachas, and I didn't go to anything because I knew they'd never let me back in again for Pesach. And I just came back to my house after 10 weeks at his house. And I know that without the surgery, there's no way I would have been there for even two days. And for me, that part was really a good way to recover from the surgery and spend the time with their family because everybody was home. And uh, I thank God all the time for the stuff that he sends me. And, and then when I don't like it, I just spend a longer time trying to figure out what was good about it. So thank, thank you very much for what you do. And uh, I'm thinking it was funny when you said, and don't make the cheesecake this year. I'm saying, I think I'm going to make myself a little tray of something cheesecakey. Otherwise, the rest of it doesn't matter. <laughs> but that's a okay. way for listening. And you know what? Right? If you just want to make the cheesecake and order everything else in, that's fine, too. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. Would anybody else like to share anything? <clears throat> okay, you know what? We can share more at the end if um, if something comes to mind. But I let let's just let's work on the conclusion now. Listen, I want to wrap up by saying each moment, as is clear from the people who shared with us, can present a lifetime of opportunities to take control of our lives. The first place to start is with time. Where have we placed the hours of our day? How are we filling it with mindlessness or being mindful? When we have a spare moment, how are we using it? Are we taking time to catch up with our kids, our parents, our spouses, siblings, friends? Are we taking time to replenish? Uh, let's, let's emphasize that one. Uh, the coronavirus imposed isolation that leaves us with almost no alone time if we're isolating with other people. Please make sure to take some time for yourself. It is critically important for every person even more so for those who are dealing not just with corona, but cancer or cancer survivorship. You can define the moments. Instead of seeing things are good or bad, you can embrace the challenge. You can reframe every moment. Like um, the woman who just spoke said, you can look for the good in everything. Each one of us can recite our life stories. But can you rewrite some of those chapters? Can you change the direction of your story? For more than 25 years, I was a cancer survivor. I am a cancer survivor, and I hate to admit it, but at some points that may have been my primary identity. But I've rewritten my story, and now I am so much more, just like each one of us is. I have the opportunity, we all have the opportunity to do this from every day. You know, there's a line from Hallel, Zehayom ish Hashem Nagila v'nid mechavo. Right? This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Life is precious. And in a very real sense, we all have the exact same amount of time today. I wish you all the wisdom and insight to embrace the ordinary, seize the everyday moments that we've been granted. Um, you know, as I finish up, we're preparing to read Megillus Root. As the story begins, we learn that Naomi encourages Ruth to leave. She doesn't want to be a burden. Without hesitation, the response is, wherever you go, I will go. Sharsheret's support programs mirror that relationship. Every day, we live with the motto, wherever you go, we will go. 
whether you view Sharsharit support or just learning about us now, please allow us to continue offering you comfort, guidance, hope, and company along your journey. We have always done our, our work through telephone, through mail, through email, so there is no change for us. We have not um, slowed down our, our support programs. Please consider taking advantage. Um, and I want to wish you a Chag Sameach. I want to turn the program over to Jillian to see if there's anything else she'd like to add and to see if anybody has any questions as we wrap up. Um, thank you, Melissa, for for that. That was really beautiful. I think that Robin described our peer support really well. She's been doing it for a very long time and she's really the expert. Uh, but one thing she did not mention about woman to woman is that we understand a stressor could be financial um, needs, especially now considering COVID. Many women, um, if you're in treatment, might be working less or not at all. And now considering the virus, many partners are not working or we're working less or not at all. And so woman to woman does recognize that and we provide financial assistance in lieu of COVID. We've also created a grocery fund di providing direct food, uh, funds for groceries. So if that is something that um, is beneficial, our email is woman to woman at mountsinai.org and you can just send an email where no questions asked about why someone might need help, we just are happy to give it. Julia, can you just specify Mount Sinai is M-T or M-O-U-N-T? Good question. Um, it's O-M-O-U-N-T. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have any questions about what we've talked about, about either of these programs? Anything else to add? Okay, then. You can reach out to us by emailing if you need support or have any questions. And I wish you all a Chag Sameach and that we get through this isolation um, quickly and, and that we all remain healthy. Thank you very much. Thank have you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.